Ha, ha, ha. 
<laughs> Trying to get on my good side. <laughs>
Say it again. Okay. My mother and brother went to the business school in Rattle, Rattle, they lived in East Jamaica, so I know they wrote that report. And that, that whole thing had a lot of memories for me because uh, they, well, my mother knew everybody was there. We went to make the Rattle, you know, running there, I always thought they were going to come to Rattle, who was one of the engineers. And anyway, it's just, this railroad has a lot of people today, and I've told us a lot of other people there. So, anyway, this is the song that I thought I thought about. Thank God for the music. Did you tell them that your grandfather was a conductor on the train? I thought that was pretty cool. I met Gene. And uh, he asked me to write the music for the song. You know, for me, it's you know, getting to hear about all these characters. Um, really, yeah, it's really cool. Um, well, it was just a short time, 36 miles all told. Took small valley towns, put them into the fold. Nothing left now, no trestles or rails. I guess there's nothing strange about a spur line of fails. But now I walk on in that West River trail. No more steam engine to haul in the mail. And if I stand still and let myself feel the old bed will tremble like me. was the conductor on the road to school Getting back the same day wasn't always the rule She told me of the black smoke, the steam was a school She'd go far away like looking into a dream But now I walk on it, that West River Trail No more steam engines are all in the mail if I stand still and let myself feel the old world bed will tremble like a Thank you. 
Society about the purchase of the West River Railroad uh, station. We realized we were being given an opportunity to save a piece of our history which would otherwise very likely be lost to us forever. The um, uh, mission of the Historical Society is to preserve our county's history and the West River Railroad is, dominates our history for over a half a century. The uh, um, impact on this valley was enormous, and Glenn will go into that for sure later, but um, it not only spanned over five decades, it connected lives and livelihood up and down this valley and beyond. So, Preserving, uh, purchasing this railroad station isn't simply about saving a historic landmark. It's about preserving the stories of the people who lived here and witnessed that 36 miles of trouble during that period. Um, the uh, purchase price of uh, the railroad was um, 41800 It um, includes the old depot building and the unique water tower uh, that stands on the property. And um, both of those were built in 1880. The Historical Society has a two-year mortgage on the property which would allow us uh, time to raise funds to offset the purchase price. The um, um, society intends and already has um, applied for grants for the renovation of the railroad station. The um, uh, renovations to open it as a museum to the West River Railroad and as an annex to the county museum right around the corner. The, um, let me see where, the uh, society has already applied and received a grant from the Preservation Trust of Vermont uh, for a conditions assessment. And a copy of that uh, assessment is in a folder in the back on the table. If you want to take a look through it, you're welcome to do that. In the meantime, um, we are uh, hoping to um, open uh, or begin, re I shouldn't say open because we're just going to begin renovations in the springtime. We're very excited about this venture uh, and we're going to be looking to all of you to help as much as you possibly can to um, 
assist us in this effort of preserving this uh, gem. And this station is a gem, as Glenn has said. Um, if you haven't already picked up a brochure, um, please do so if you can take a look through that and consider uh, the level of giving societies that are outlined in there. Um, the, whether you wish to sponsor a mile of 36 miles of trouble or one of the other giving societies, um, all of us here can be part of the history in creating this new museum. And um, we are um, hoping to uh, open, well, as I say, begin renovations in, in the spring. And um, in the meantime, tonight's launching our, our campaign for that. Um, we can be the uh, history of this new museum in the same way that the founders of the Historical Society were over 80 years ago when they laid the first cornerstone of the existing museum. And that was in the midst of the Great Depression. So I think we can do this. Um, thank you all for coming. And uh, uh, we hope you will help support us in this effort and be a part of its history. Dan Brooks, I think you all know. <laughs> He's not wearing a name. <laughs> and um, he just has a few words and he will Thank you. Thank you. Woo! Thank you. Um, I can't say enough, and I won't you know, just repeat everything that Laura said, but um, as the Mantel family saw fit to give us this offer, I just can't thank them enough. Um, and along with the station, there's a number of items that originally went with the station that we also inherited with our purchase. But anyway, I'd like to thank the uh, Mantel family for their kind offer to give us the first dibs on it. And I'd also like to thank our board of directors who were all over this. We took a pretty big leap of faith, but we just knew we had to do it. There's no doubt about it. Um, I would like to give a little extra recognition to our president, Laura, and our treasurer, they just took the ball by the horns and they've really been after this thing. And um, thank you very much. Back when I was growing up in New Bain here, we actually, um, I had a fascination with the Western Railroad. And so over my lifetime, I've had a chance to speak with so many people that either worked on the train, rode on the train, um, or as kids, they would go, they'd hear the whistle and they'd head to the station just to watch the train come. Um, so many stories, I'm sure a lot of you have the same thing. And in the mid-60s, the Mantell family let us use the train station as like a youth center. And so we put a pool table in there, and we had a record player, and then we locked the place up pretty good. But it was still the train station, it was still special to us. It holds a really special spot, um, personally. And so I'm just over the top. And I'm just hoping that... Um, Everybody can get on board with whatever you can do to help us out to keep this going. And again, I looked into the station and I looked into the West River Railroad pretty much my adult life. And I thought I knew a lot about it until I met Glenn. <laughs> so I don't want to hold you up anymore. But anyway, um, please make welcome Glenn Annis.
I'll do it the best I can. Um, <laughs> you might bring a little higher. Yeah, there you go. Comes out. Years ago, how many here are familiar with Lewis R. Brown and Harold Jeff Berry? Jeff Berry was my mentor. My mother worked with his wife at the Redmond Memorial Hospital. And one day he gave me a photograph. And it was of the Mountain Valley Brown House, south of Brown, uh, just north of the Brattleboro Station. And from there, it just never stopped. I was looking at all my stuff yesterday and going, Jeff, I've got <laughs> so much stuff. And I fell in love with the Western Railroad and just started to collect and just started to enjoy the history and just started to get into it so much that it got to the point where now I have to share it with everybody else. I don't live and read the West River Railroad, but my wife would disagree with you. <laughs> anyway, the history of the West River Railroad basically starts back in the 1840s when railroad fever was hitting the country, and New England was not any different than that. What happened in the 1840s is Everybody was trying to get from the fresh water, uh, I'm sorry, not the fresh water, the open water ports in New England to the Great Lakes, either Boston, Halifax, Providence, going through the state of Vermont, Massachusetts, and up into the Great Lakes. What happened initially was the Fitchburg Railroad, the Brattleboro and Fitchburg chartered the railroad to go from Fitchburg, Massachusetts, to Millers Falls, Vermont, and then up to Brattleboro. At the same time, the Bennington and Rutland was starting from Burlington down to uh, Rutland and then south to Bellows Falls. At the same time, the Vermont and Massachusetts was building north into Brattleboro, and there was going to be a railroad war to see who got north first. Unfortunately, the Fitchburg Railroad, which uh, the Cheshire Railroad, which was then purchased by the Fitchburg Railroad, got from Winchester, Massachusetts, up to Bellows Falls first. And the original charter of the West River Railroad, which was to run from Brattleboro up through the mountains, through Weston, under Mount Holly, into the backside and into Rutland, lost out to the Bennington and Rutland, which was able to build from Bellows Falls, or, I'm sorry, from Rutland down to Bellows Falls first. Consequently, the railroad fever in the valley kind of died until the 1870s, when again the charter of the West River Railroad was revisited, and the interest in the valley decided to go ahead and see if they could bond the railroad. Go to the next slide. What we ended up was in uh, the charter was a railroad going from Brattleboro up through uh, London, up through to South London area although it would never be built that far. Initially, um, my thought was to go ahead and portray this as what was the history of the West River Valley and what was happening at the time that the railroad was built. For the first thing, there never were 36 miles of trouble. There were only 35.4 miles. <laughs> And I, I don't like to refer to 36 miles of trouble because what you have to remember is over 50 years, the goods and services, the people of the West River Valley moved back and forth up and down the valley on the railroad, which was the lifeline of the valley until the 1927 flood, which ended everything. Well, basically ended everything. Next slide, please. Brattleboro was the southern hub or the southern terminus of the West River Railroad. This is a photo taken of about 1901 showing the Brattleboro Yards. One of the interesting things about Brattleboro is it was a terrible hazard in that all, as the trains came in, the West River came in from the north. If you look on the north side, you can see a roundhouse, which is the Vermont Valley Railroad. And interestingly enough, the, I have to backtrack a little bit, is when the Burlington and Rutland built to Bellows Falls, as part of the Rutland Railroad, the coup de grace for the West River Railroad was the Rutland Railroad then built from Bellows Falls down to Brattleboro, and then turned around and would eventually lease that to the center of Vermont. But that's another part of the story for later. As we look at Brattleboro Yards, you can see the second Brattleboro station and the first Brattleboro station in the picture. Brattleboro still has two stations. Most people don't realize that the original Brattleboro Station still exists. The Brattleboro Yards in the Brattleboro and Whitehall era were a spaghetti maze of tracks, a three-foot gauge in the back, 
and the standard gauge towards the front. And as you can see, anything that came down from South London area or was going up to South London area would have to be transshipped from the error gauge cars to standard gauge cars. If you look in the yard, you can see we have the narrow gauge cars closer to the platforms and out in the back, and then the standard gauge cars just to the right. Anyway, better, this is the West River came down from the north on the inside track, crossed over into the Brattleboro Station on the outside track, and then the went down and back in. These are the narrow gauge cars right here. These are the standard gauge cars to the, out, uh, the outside. These are more narrow gauge yard, cars in the yard. Part of the problem, again, was everything had to be moved between the standard and the narrow gauge, and this would be the problem. Anyway, next slide, please. Again, this is a map of Brattleboro showing the second station and the overall yard as it was existed. The second station of Brattleboro was built in 1881 replacing the original station, which was moved back to the water edge, which became the Swift Meat Packing Plant, which is now the Vermont Archery Building, Brattleboro. Next slide. This is probably as good as it gets. This is the September 1913 schedule of um, the West River, the Brattleboro and South London area, which at the time was the second division of the Southern Division. As you can see, these are daily trains back and forth, but if you pad up and down, there's something wrong. There are three trains going up, and four trains coming down. Oh. <laughs> Where did that other train go? <laughs> and as the railroad was operated, it was operated by timetable, and train order. So normally if a train wasn't on the schedule, it would operate as an extra train where it was just operating by train orders. Trains such and such is cleared to operate between uh, South London area and Brattleboro, yielding to all traffic or meet at such and such a point. And that's normally what this kind of timetable indicates. But anyway, 1913 was probably the banner year for the railroad showing both up and down trains. As you can see, there was only one freight train a day going up and down. Everything else was either a mail or a mixed train. A mixed train, uh, I'm sorry, that's all mail. Passenger or a mixed train. Next slide, please. This was Brattleboro as it existed about 1881 to 1905. The narrow gauge passengers were under a canopy on the north end of the station. The train would come in from South London Dairy, cross over the main line and run into the uh, passenger station itself. The engine would then disconnect after it would back out after everybody was off the train and they push the passenger car back in. On the right hand side is a narrow gauge train going north to South London Dairy. Interestingly enough, the train on the right is about where the current Amtrak station is. The, it, the current Amtrak station is just off the right of the hill there. And then narrow gauge freight cars in the back sitting in the, the sitting in the yard. Again, part of the problem here was that the yard was so compact. And I think what I'd like you to do is clear your mind of Brattleboro now. If you think of Brattleboro today, you're seeing everything from the station all the way down to the uh, uh, South Sumo's number. But Brattleboro wasn't like that in the 1880s. Brattleboro basically existed from the Vermont Valley Roundhouse behind Central Valley Church, uh, Central Congregational Church, just down to the south end about where uh, the old barrel is fuel. That was a railroad. There was nothing else south of that. There was nothing else north of that. Everything happened in that one section of the yard between Barrow's Fuel and the station. You had the Vermont Valley Railroad. You had the Central Vermont Railroad. You had the West River Railroad. You had the Boston and Maine Railroad. You had four. Vermont Valley was essentially uh, Boston and Maine, but you had three railroads operating in a short, confined yard. Next slide, please. This is Brattleboro after 1905 when the railroad was standard gauge. What is, they've done is the tracks have been removed from underneath the platform and now all uh, passenger traffic 
to and from the depot is on the platform to the right. And again, this was part of the problem because people were getting hit by the trains or were having to watch out for the trains. And there was such action going on behind the depot that they finally decided enough was enough. And they started moving the yard to the south, and they also went ahead and the West River was standard gate by that point. Next slide. This is a kind of spaghetti junction, which is the way the tracks existed from 1901 to 1905 with the West River coming across the Stone Ridge Bridge. But as we know it, the passenger train switching off to the left and going into the platform with the, pass with the freight train continuing on down past the station to switch out behind the station. Next slide. In order to operate a railroad of this size, the West River Railroad <coughs> ordered three locomotives, the Brownboro, the London Dairy, and the J.L. Martin. They were numbered number one, two, and number three, with number one and two coming in uh, 1879, and the J.L. Martin coming in, number three coming in 1880. The uh, first two, Brattleboro and Londonderry, were called mobile type engines, while number three was a 240, which was a strictly a passenger engine. Now, when you're looking at a West River photo, it's kind of, you're trying to figure out what engine is what engine, and the Central Vermont Railroad slash West River Railroad really doesn't help you out a whole lot because as the engines were delivered, they were number number one, number two, and number three. In 1892, the Central Vermont renumbered all the locomotives and added 19 in front of them. So number one becomes 191, number two becomes 192. And three becomes one down three. That's really easy, right? Wow. Okay, in 1900, the Central Vermont went, again, went ahead and renumbered again. <laughs> now you think you're confused there. Number one, which was the Brattleboro, now become, which went to uh, 191, now becomes number two. <laughs> number two, the London Dairy, which became 192, becomes number three. And number three, the J.L. Martin, which was became number 193, now comes to number one. So if you're looking at a photograph and you're trying to figure out which engine is which, you have to look at what the tender was lettered and what whether it was carrying central or not. And then you have to look at the negative itself. A lot of times people will misidentify negatives just by looking at them. And just to say, oh, that's number two. That's obviously it's the brow. Next slide, please. This is number three, <laughs> which is the London Dairy, sitting on the Brattleboro Roundhouse. Initially, the uh, West River built all of their uh, facilities to the north of Brattleboro across the Arch Bridge up behind the Dunham building, but a new roundhouse was built in 1882, down where we, if you remember where the existing roundhouse was, and slowly the West River migrated down to that facility. This is the London Dairy number three, built as number two, renumbered to number three in, at the roundhouse, so you can tell by the number that that's dating it after 1900. Next slide, please. This is the J.L. Martin, number three, as delivered as number three, built by Danforth and Cook in 1880, goes again on the bottom to Central Vermont 193 in 1892, to Central Vermont number one in 1900. Were they fueled by wood? Is that what we're seeing in the back? Yes. Oh. As, as constructed, they were wood-fired engines. However, there was one uh, coal-fired engine, but in the life of number one, two, and three, they were strictly wood-fired engines while they were on the West River Railroad. <coughs> Next slide, please. This is number 193, which is number three, which is not number one, so you can tell this is eight. between 1892 and 1900, as it's on the passenger lead coming into the passenger station in Brattleboro. One of the unique things about the West River branch is it was controlled by what is called a ball signal. And a ball signal is such that the operator in the shanty 
receives a clearance from the dispatcher to allow the train to proceed onto the West River track or come off the West River track. And the ball signal was two balls to allow the West River train to onto the West River track or off the West River track into the station. And unfortunately, there isn't a good um, picture of the ball signal. But if you look, this is the mask that sat that where the ball signal was located. It was located by the crossing tender on crossing tender shanty on the north side of the tracks. Next slide, please. This is the JL Martin in Brattleboro number 193. I like this photo only because it shows the train getting ready to head to South London there. The JL Martin was purchased specifically to be a passenger engine. However, we all know if we read the history of the West River Railroad, that things didn't always work out the way they were intended. Next slide, please. This is again a picture of, I guess I'd call it Spaghetti Junction. This is a standard gauge train getting ready to head north. However, you can see how the narrow gauge track has to cross over and get over the arch bridge before it heads north out of Broadway. Next slide, please. Again, this is just an illustration of the same thing. It has to cross over the diamond that it shows with DC Cutlets Union Company and goes north up to Broadway, north up to South London. One of the interesting things at the time, although there was a water plug or a standpipe at the depot in Brattleboro, the West River used a water tank that sat just on the other side of the arch bridge up against uh, where the Dunham building is today. Uh, e. Crosby and Company was a grain store located in Brattleboro. He also had two other grain stores that he operated on the West River, one in Jamaica, or I'm sorry, East Wardsboro, uh, East Jamaica slash Wardsboro depot the other one in South London dairy. Eventually he would become Agway and move to the big milling company on the south end of town. Next slide. This is a northbound passenger train getting ready to leave the depot. This is kind of an interesting photo because the combine behind the engine or the passenger car behind the engine would actually survive the railroad and end up at a logging railroad down in Pennsylvania. I didn't throw the photos in here, too, but I've got photos that were sent to me by another closet, closet West River fan showing them unloading the cars in Logan, Pennsylvania. And this combine and one of the other passenger cars survived to go down to Pennsylvania. Next slide. This is Brattleboro from the north, about behind Harris Place, looking to the south. The photo dates pre- uh, Second station exists in the photo as a, the original Brattleboro Roundhouse, which was built in 1865, so it's 1881, the second station. Anyway, it, it's a good illustration of what happens as the train comes out of Brattleboro, crosses the Arch Bridge, which originally was a wooden covered bridge. Next is the water tank for the West River. <coughs> Then it comes up along the engine house, which is here, the passenger shed, past the Vermont Valley roundhouse, on the inside track, and heading up towards <coughs> three bridges. Next slide. This is just another, look, another shot taken from the south, looking north of the engine house, car shop, Vermont Valley Railroad, Vermont Valley roundhouse. And if you think Vermont Valley, think Boston and Maine because the Vermont Valley was essentially lost at this time. The Boston, uh, less resort, or less even leased, from the, leased by the Boston Maine. Anyway, this is the northbound track heading up around the three bridges. Next slide. This is engine 192, which would be the London Mary heading south of the Broward. Now this would be the now this is yeah, this is the London area in South End of Brattleboro for the southbound mail train behind Harris Place. Next slide. Winter was always a challenge for any railroad in New England and the West River was no was not unaffected by this is a snow train which it actually has two of the engines and I can't tell 
whether the train is trying to get up the south London area or is trying to get back to Morello. But it's on the inbound track um, heading behind Center Church and it's taking two engines together in whichever direction they're going. <laughs> Next slide. Again, same, same train, same location, Brattleboro to the south. One of the interesting things in this photograph that doesn't most people don't realize is the snow fighting. We, we talk about snow plows, but we also talk about flangers, which is a device that was used to clean up the snow between the rails. And this is one of the first photographs that exists of a restaurant flanger in the train. Next slide. Next slide we come to is three bridges, which is where the Rattle and White Hall cross over Putney Road. If you look today, the CBPS slash Green Mountain substation is just off to the right. You can still see these abutments where we went down the covered bridge we crossed over the West River. Next slide. This is a construction shot in 1880 showing the original bridge that crossed over three bridges over the West River at Three Bridges with the covered highway bridge in the background and the Vermont Valley slash Boston and Main Bridge behind it. Next slide, please. This is the JL Martin on the north end of the trestle coming off of Three Bridges getting ready to go down into Bradley's Meadows. Next slide. Unfortunately, we all know what happened in 1886 and this is the wreck of the southbound mix coming into Brattleboro where uh, J.J. Green was killed. Next slide, please. Three Bridges Wreck of 1886. Again, Engineer A.J. Smith and McVeigh Station Agent J.J. Green fatally injured. Next slide. Now, never, one of the things when you're looking at a picture and somebody offers you another one, never say, hey, I've already got it, I don't need it. Now, do you think I just showed you the same two views? If you go back, we'll go to the next one. Same location, the people have moved. So you've got to be very careful when you're looking at a photograph because subtle things will change and some piece of information may be really important to what you're trying to research may be in that photograph that you miss. I almost missed this and my brother called me on it. <laughs> Next slide, please. Uh, north end of the wreck, you see uh, West River would be less two boxcars, a flat car. Mm -hmm. Next slide. What happened in that situation? Uh, that what? is to be debated. Um, I really, some say the conductor put the brakes on as the engineer tried to race across the bridge. Other stories say that the bridge was in a weakened state. I don't know. I, my opinion is worth exactly what you pay for it. <laughs> so I, I honestly don't know. This is the rebuilt bridge that was placed across the West River in place of the wood bridge. One of the things to think about as the West River Railroad came under the control, I guess I have to dis uh, digress just a little bit because I didn't really go into When the West River Railroad was built, the towns that bonded the West River Railroad, um, if you look at it, uh, Beers 18, 1869 map, you can kind of see what towns bonded the railroad. When the railroad and the map will kind of tell you which towns are planning to put the money in for the railroad because it tends to follow the towns that put the money in and bond for it. When the railroad finally started construction, there wasn't enough money to finish the railroad and the railroad was then picked up by the New London Northern Railroad and the New London Northern Railroad gave the West River Railroad Company the money to finish the railroad and lay the rails. New London Northern Railroad at the time was a subsidiary slash shell corporation of the Central Vermont Railroad. So in a roundabout way, the Central Vermont had gained control of the West River Railroad through 
given the money, allowing the new railroad northern company to provide the money to finish the railroad. What, as the bridges fell down, the center of Vermont was one that was constantly maintaining and upgrading the line. And what they did was, as a bridge would fall down or be torn down or need replacement, they would replace it with a standard gauge bridge, giving the hint to the residents of the valley that eventually the railroad was going to be standard gauge. Next slide. This is an interesting slide only because I'm not sure exactly what it tells you. This is a, a slide by Eastern Illustrating Company, which is out of Penobscot, was out of Maine. The company was formed in 1909. But if you notice the guardrails on the bridge, the inner guardrail, the spacing is wrong for that inner guardrail. In 1901, they were having problems getting granite out of the quarries in West Dummerston down to the, to the transshipment point of the railroad depot. And so what the Central Vermont did is laid a third rail between Brattleboro and the West Dummerston Ramp. And my suspicion, and I'm not sure if it is true or not, but that this is the narrow gauge line as it comes out, shoots out from Brattleboro to South London there. Subsequently, uh, with a subsequent standard gauge third rail laid on the outside. I'm not sure, but I have a suspicion that that's what this is showing. Next slide, please. I missed this one. Up. A little, little. When you hit that delete button on the computer, be very careful. Sometimes it does a lot more than you think. <laughs> About three days ago, I was working on the, on the program. I had all my storyboard lined up. I haven't done this program probably 15 years to a public audience or to a private audience in over five years. And I used to be doing it strictly by slides. The last one I did was digital. And so I'm a little rusty. But anyway, I was getting all that. Really happy I got it and said, you want to save this photograph? I said, no. Well, there went three days of work. <laughs> I have a daughter who is a semi-good computer whiz. She said, no, Dad, it's not coming back. <laughs> anyway, as we cross over Putney Road, we head up into what's called Bradley Meadows. In 1920, the Wyndham County Cooperative Creamery Association built the, built the uh, creamery on the north side of the tracks. This is right opposite of the marina. This building still exists today. It's now the PC company that's building the bridge over Route 30. But this was a, a, a creamery that brought from milk was coming down from the farms in the valley to Brattleboro, supplemented by milk from the local Brattleboro area. And it was being shipped from Brattleboro down to the Boston area. And this is showing high water at the 27th flood, but it's probably the only really good view I have of the milk plant in Brattleboro. Next slide, please. This is uh, from the Putney Road side looking out. It still looks very much like that today. Next slide, please. This is a southbound train coming into Brattleboro. It's a common slide. Everybody sees it. But there's a, a story to this slide that most people don't recognize. Number 53 was the type of engine that was common on the West River trains in the standard gauge era from 1905 to 1927. But if you look at the third car behind the engine, that is a milk car. And I, I showed this to a couple of people, and they were like, right, this is a Boston and Maine milk car on a West River train. The only place this could have come from was the creamery. So it's a milk car heading into Brattleboro, getting ready to be interchanged with a Boston and Maine to go to the Whiting Creamery Corporation in Boston. Next slide, please. And in 1922, lo and behold, what shows up, this is the first timetable I have in 1922. The creamery was built 
and the spur was laid to the, to the creamery in November of 1920. So you can see that now when the milk station has their own station stop. So this was, as the train would come down, it would start to pick up passengers while they were switching out the creamery. Next slide, please. I digress here because I'm going up the line. I'm not going to go back and forth. I used to jump back and forth going standard gauge, narrow gauge, standard gauge, narrow gauge, or standard gauge all the way up to the, yeah, or narrow gauge all the way up and then switch over to standard gauge. But I'm taking this more station to station as we head up the line. And this is engine number one, which came to the West River in 1930. It is an Alco plantation type locomotive. <laughs> What was happening in the 1920s, the Alpha Locomotive Company and the Baldwin Locomotive Company were making a standard type of engine for the uh, Cuban sugar plantations. And a lot of the engines, there was some financial dealings back and forth with Cuba where a lot of the engines were not delivered to Cuba and engine number one ended up on the West River. It's the Build date is 1930, but I have paperwork from the Alpha company stating that it was probably built actually a little bit earlier. Next slide, please. This is engine number one again on the West River. It is in Brattleboro by the engine house. Engine number one would actually survive the West River for a long time. In uh, 1933, it was sold to the Frankfurt and Cincinnati River in Frankfurt, Kentucky where it joined three of its sister locomotives. It was later, later sold to the St. Louis Paper Company of Detroit, New York, where it lasted up into the 1950s. And the background of this is an interesting little place. This is engine number 53 after it's been sidelined by engine number one sitting at the Brattle River Engine 53 would eventually be scrapped in 1936. Well, after the flood of 27, it was loaned to the West River Railroad under the, um, with the agreement that when the West River ended operations, it would revert back to the central control of the central mall, which it did in 1936. Next slide. This is Bradley's Meadow. Bradley's Meadows is just north of the milk plant, just north of the marina, on the north side of the old right of way. It's, it's Hamilton, recently it was Hamilton's Field, it's where WTSA has their big, had their antenna. This is a southbound train shortly after the railroad has been built, and it is all the cars are lettered Brattleboro and Whitehall in the engine. The JL Martin is lettered in number three. Next slide. This is a photo taken up on Lancaster, looking down into Bradley's Meadow. This is Bradley's Meadow on the right. You can see the road bed as it heads out towards South London area. It makes the curve following the West River. 91 today is the new. 91 is right here, and the new bridge is going to be ready for us. But this was Bradley's Meadow. Next slide, please. North of Bradley's Meadows, the West River follows the follows the West River on the north side of the river, the east side of the river. On the, let's try the east side of the river. It comes up here. This is uh, Dio's Hole on Route 30, if you're familiar with that. This is Black Mountain in the background where it comes up. And right in here is where it will cross Rice Farm Road and then help it head into the quarries. Next slide, please. This is an overview of the quarries. Quarry was in, in operation in West Dummerston before the railroad came, with the first quarry being Bailey's Quarry, which was on the west side of the river. But Flint. George Lyons was supposedly the first person to develop the quarries, the first quarries in West Dummerston. First quarries. Um, he only lasted a short time between 18, he was quarrying in this quarry 1880 to 1891 when it went to a Grant Quarry. Flint Granite Quarries, and then in 1920, Presbury Leland, say that fast three times, um, went ahead and got the lease for the quarry. Basically, Presbury Leland, uh, these, these quarrying operations, had leased the whole west side of the mountain. Next slide, please. 
This is an overview of the Lions Granite Works in Dunnerston. The Iron Bridge, Green Iron Bridge sits here, Tap Bridge is here, the old jelly mill behind it, and the main line heading right from Brattleboro to West Dunnerston. Next slide, please. This is an overview of the Stone Shed, taken in 1893. Next slide. This is looking up. This is one of Bruce Chapman's photographs. He kind of gave this to me one day when we were visiting, and I almost died when I looked at it. It was a great shot yesterday. Uh, again, the stone derricks, black cars, and the stone shed in the background. Next slide, please. This is looking into the quarry. This quarry was mostly a structural granite block and paving stone. Not so much monuments as Craig B. Lehman would be later, but it was more structural and paving stones. And next slide, please. I'm going to drop down out of there. Anyway, um, can we go back? Two of the important things that came out of this quarry were the Vermont Monument at Gettysburg and the Plaza Hotel in New York City. Now, for the life of me, I was in New York City about a month ago, a month and a half ago, I was trying to find where the brand it is on the Plaza Hotel. They said that's where it came from. I saw a lot of marble when I was there. Couldn't find it. Next slide, please. North of Lyons Granite, the front granite, the railroad continues along the backside of Black Mountain. This will be the site of the Presby Leland Quarry, which would open up after 1920. And the railroad crosses over the West River and into West Emerson Village. Next slide, please. This is the Presby Leland Quarry. This is taken after the 27th flood when the railroad is basically in a semi-dormant state, but Presby Leland was a big block uh, monument company shipping blocks to New York for mausoleums, headstones. But in this time, they're also crushing granite for a Route 9 reconstruction program in between Brattleboro and Marlboro. <coughs> Next slide. This is looking into the Presby Leland Quarry. They also did block uh, stone paving stones, though. At this time in operation, you would have Presby Leland operating the two quarries. Lester, your dad was operating, your grandfather was operating the other side, right? He was operating the Lions Quarry of Cajun. Then on the back side of the mountain was the Clark Quarry. So at the time, there were four quarries operating in West Dunnerston, Dunnerston to some. Next slide. <coughs> this is uh, Central Mount Wall Hall Flat Semi 101. This was a unique car that was used to carry large outside blocks of stones. This car operated between Brattleboro and the stone sheds on the south end of Brattleboro and between Waterbury and Brattleboro, where they were taking the um, Granite Company in Waterbury was also shipping to Brattleboro. This is how outside outsized granite was shipped. Next slide. This is looking over from the Presby Lunar Quarry across the West River into the village of West Dumberston. Next slide. This is the original bridge going across the West River from West Dumberston. Uh, Dumberston to West Dumberston. This slide has always bugged me for some reason. And it took me the other day when it finally it kind of dawned on me that I was looking at the slide and I was realized I was looking at it from the north side instead of the south side. Uh, the stone points to deflect the ice are on this side, which obviously means that this is north heading south, so West Dumberston is on that side and the quarries are on this side. Now we saw it was the other way around. For the life of me couldn't figure out why it just didn't work. Next slide. This is the original bridge framed over. It was a town covered bridge with the tracks running on top of the bridge. The lower portion of the bridge sheathed in to provide some sort of uh, rock protection and, and to enhance the structural longevity um, of the bridge. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, one of the things you gotta worry about is fire, too. And then this time they finally figured out that maybe fire bears are looking again into the village of West Dumberston. Next slide. 
This is the replacement bridge for that bridge. It was an iron bridge built in 1897. It was, you could, the Lot specifically ordered this bridge to standard gauge specifications with the intention that eventually the railroad would be standard gauge. Next slide. Looking across from the quarries into West Dummerston. Dummerston Covered Bridge is right up here. And the railroad continues up along the side by Maple Valley in here. Next slide. Fortunately, all good plans don't always work out the way you think they're going to. In 1904, I believe it was April of 1904, or March of 1904, the ice came out of the West River a little, a little bit early and knocked out the north abutment, putting the railroad bridge into the water. Next slide. Are they pretty good at trestling and replacing them? This is temporary repairs of the bridge. They're just sitting in the water. Next slide. This is engine number two, which would be the. Think about this for a second. Uh, <coughs> this is the Londonary. No, this is the Brown. <laughs> See, it's just it's it's really confusing when you think about it. I used to be able to do this. I got the time of minute. Anyway, the, the significance of this photo is, is the train. It's a southbound mail train coming into Brattleboro, stopping at the West Dummerston Depot, which is the second depot, the first depot having burned to the ground in 1893. Interestingly enough, all of the depots on the West River Railroad were built to a standard plan using standard window sashes, standard architectural features. There were differences in the stations themselves, but Brattleboro, I'm sorry, West Dummerston, uh, West Dummerston, uh, Corners, Williamsville. New Fane wasn't. New Fane is just a little different. Um, the original West Dummerston was the same as Williamsville, which was the same as West Townsend, which was the same as Wardsboro and Winhall. For all the same basic dimensions where Townsend and but the to get, get from that, they're all built to standard plans. The two that were that stood out the most were South Londonderry and Jamaica. Jamaica and South Londonderry were duplicates of each other. Uh, Winhall. Winhall and Townsend were the same. Anyway, next slide, please. This is West Dummerston after it's been rebuilt after the fire. This station is significant in that it was a standard center Vermont. Southern Division plan station that, for the type of station that was built in the 1890s. If we look down Three Rivers and some of the other ones on the south of the end of the central line were built to the same design. Next station. This is taken up from Dummerston looking over into West Dummerston. The covered bridge is off on the left. It hugs the backside of Sugar Mountain. The Maple Valley ski area starts right in here. Next slide. This is taken by a baggage master on the West River Railroad of a train coming into Williamsville, which is the second stop on the West River Railroad. This is engine number one, which would be the railroad. Next slide, please. This is Williamsville looking to go north. Why Williamsville? One of the things that is really significant about Williamsville is Williamsville itself sits on the bottom of a sharp grade that commences once you cross this bridge and head up towards Rand's Crossing. The rest of the railroad starts a slow climb out of Brattleboro, not to any significant grade until it gets to about where JB Auto is, where Upper and Lower Dunderston meet on the north side. Then it starts a climb to the top of the grade. And we'll get, we'll get to that in just a second. Next slide, please. This is a photograph by a man of, named of Lucius Cathan. A couple of months ago, I spent some time in New York City at the New York Historical Society. And was, they have a collection of West River photographs. And I was amazed to look at the stuff. 
and realize that some of the photographs that we have that haven't been identified were taken by Lucius Kaithley. But the Kaithley family was a Townsend family, and one of their relatives eventually donated these negatives in their glass plates, but there's a collection of about 50 in the Art Historical Society of the West River Railroad in Townsend and the surrounding areas. This is one of Lucius's photographs taken on the north side of the Rock River Trail, so looking towards Williamsville or the Williamsville <coughs> Station in the background. This would be shortly after the railroad was constructed. Next slide, please. Lucius was lucky he got a train that day, too. It's not a great photograph, but it, it's a, taken from the same spot at the same time. Next slide. This is Williamsville looking north. This is the second bridge over the Rock River, where you cross the Rock River, go towards Newfane, up, start a slow climb up through Sand Hill and up into the Newfane Village proper. Next slide, please. And a southbound train heading into Williamsville. I have to throw a train in here, but every now and then people just don't like to see. Next slide. This is Rand's Crossing, which sat on the grade between Williamsville and Newfane. Now, Rand's Crossing never appears in any official West River timetable, but the stories are always told of how it was a flag stop, that if you were there when the train was coming, you could flag the train down, the train would stop for you. It makes sense that it was probably a flag stop because the construction shares many of the same features that the West River stations did. This is right in the area. Rance Crossing is right around where Dan Brooks' parents live. <laughs> one of, one of the, if you're trying to figure out this, this barn that still exists along Old Route 30, if you're heading south, before you climb up to New York School. Next slide, please. Now, why Newfane? Well, if you look, think about what I told you. Newfane is, sits, actually sits well, let's, let's find it. Does anybody know where the top of the grade is? The steepest grade between Brattleboro and South London there he is. We're sitting on it, right here. We're at the top of the grade. Between Brattleboro and South London Dairy, the again they start a slow climb about where upper and lower Dummerston north side of or upper and lower Dummerston Roads meet. Start a slow climb until you cross the Rock River Bridge, and then you go up a 2.41 degree slope. That means for every 100 feet the railroad runs, it goes up 2.41 feet. Which is okay if you can climb it, but what goes up must come down. You get to the top of, where oh, this is right about, Rand's Crossing is right about here which is at the top of a 2.05 percent grade. Then you get a slow climb to Newfane proper, coming up Newfane Depot, and then you start down. So when the trains were getting coming from Brattleboro to South London Dairy, you had just got up to almost to the top of a steep grade and you need to put water in the engine before you headed north on the valley. Conversely, before you came southbound, you had to water up again in Townsend. But what happens when you get to the top of the grade again? When you go up, you got to go down. From the backside here, starts down, you go down a 2.27 degree curve, uh, uh, slope. And the only problem is, is what happens at the bottom of both of these curves? Or both of these, I, I gave it away. What happens at the bottom of both of these grades? you end up in sharp curves and a bridge. And what you must do is, the trains must not go fast across the bridges or through the curves. So you are not going to be able to get any speed to come up the hill from either direction. The next slide, please. Why is this important? This is the <laughs> and this was an extra from uh, coming back from the towns and lumber mills. Five lows of lumber and number three, which was the London Dairy. Um, unfortunately, at this point, the engine only was the only piece of equipment that was carrying an air brake. The freight cars didn't have an air brake. And at this time, 
and point, point in time, the air brakes were inoperative on the locomotive. So the engine started down the grade from here going down to the Rock River Bridge and lost control of the train. They only had two brakemen for five cars. Needless to say, the results are what we got here. This is number three off the track. Next slide. Just imagine the force that that thing took as it went and it rolled. Next slide. This would be looking to the north. Again, next slide. And this is the result. The engineer broke his arm, the fireman survived, and the engine would be rebuilt to run the last train on the West River. One of the interesting things here is, again, this is a picture of the flanger on the right ahead of the passenger. So anybody guess what engine that is? Dale Next slide. Again, Sand Hill Runaway. Coming into Newfane, this is an early shop looking north into the depot. Again, one of the things you can notice is that there's still a grade coming up to the depot. In the background, you can see this uh, water tank. I'm very fortunate in that in the west river of, of the stations that were on the west river, there are only three that are not really reconstructed beyond what they originally were. They are Williamsville, Newfane, and what in Townsend Depot. South Londonderry is very close to all the other stations. Uh, you know, original stations have been modified or moved so that they don't really reflect what the stations were. Wardsboro is now on Turkey Mountain Road. We will go on. Next slide, please. Newfane looking into the depot again. One of the things that is interesting in this slide is that notice how close the train runs to the side of the bridge right there. And if you walk up there today and try and just imagine, you think it ought to be a lot closer to the uh, station platform, but it really isn't. Notice this nice crossing sign. Do you see that crossing sign? See the crossing sign right there? You know where that is? Yeah. <laughs> One of the interesting things a couple years ago when we were looking, I, I went up and visited the Mantels and <coughs> was shown their barn and on the floor of the barn was this crossing sign and I was dying when I saw it. And it was like just a blast from the past. Next slide please. This is JJ Green sitting on the station platform again. Jason JJ Green was killed in 1886. Well what is interesting about again about the Newfane Depot is the Newfane Depot as it exists today is not as it existed in uh, prior to uh, 1907. In 1907, 1908, there was an addition built onto the station, and the freight door was moved from about five to ten feet. The station, no, actually, it was probably more than that. Probably a ten-foot addition built on the station. But this is how the station originally existed. Next slide. Yeah. This is the tank. Again, as you before you get to the top of the grain, you have to top off. Next slide. This is. I call it flea market crossing, but I'm not sure that's the that's what I call it. It was called Three Roads Crossing at one time. It says you start down the grade by past the barn down towards the flea market, which is over here. This is the start of the downgrade into Salmon Hole Bridge. Next slide, please. This is the grade. All along the top of the grade down to the Salmon Hole Bridge, the railroad at the time it was built consisted of many trestles. I think there's like four between the top of the grade and Salmon Hall Bridge. All of these trestles have been filled in 
now, but if you look where people have dug their driveways through, every now and then you can still see some of the trestle bins sticking out in parts of the road, in parts of their driveways. Next slide, please. This is Salmon Hole Bridge. The only reason I put this in here, this is, the curve is not 30 degrees at this time, it's more a 20 degree curve, but when you came down at the time the railroad was built and up until it was standard gauge in 1905, the rare, we had a 30 degree curve. It came down from Newfane into a 30 degree curve. What is 30 degrees? 30 degrees is a displacement of 30 feet for every 100 feet that the railroad runs. So as a severe, you stake out 100, go out 30. This was the sharpest curve on the railroad. And as you're coming out, the railroad came from Townsend, started to climb, came across the Salmon Hole Bridge and into a 30 degree curve. And obviously you are not going to be able to get any kind of speed coming across. A lot of times the train would end up doubling the hill. Doubling the hill is a term that kind of takes you dividing your train in half. You're only taking half the tonnage to the top of the grade. And a lot of times the train would be forced to double the hill between Townsend and Newfane. The only problem with doubling the hill is, depending on where the train stalled and you had to cut off your other cars, you didn't set your brakes properly, your train was going to go for a ride. And there are stories told of the engineers getting up to Newfane, cutting off their first cut of cars, coming back down to find their second cut of cars have already gone, and they're on their way into Townsend. <laughs> Next slide, please. This is the original Salmon Hole Bridge, again, at uh, Howe Truss. And this portion is where Route 30 goes underneath the Salmon Hole Bridge. This is looking to the north. Next slide, please. This is a um, Lucius Cathan photo showing one of the first trains on the West River heading south. Again, a town covered bridge that's been covered over. The wagon road in between Newfane and the town. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, the first bridge didn't survive too long. It burned. They built a second bridge, again, a covered bridge. This time, it is a town lattice truss. Town lattice truss is a type of bridge that was um, fancy and was developed by an engineer on the Boston and Maine Railroad, that engineer, drafting type engineer, 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 not a train engineer. And it was a type of bridge that the Boston Main Railroad used a lot. And this is one of the uses of a town lattice truss on the center of the Mont Railroad. Next slide, please. This is a town lattice truss all framed in. There's a long open, fill, open truss here on the north side. This would be filled in later. I believe this is a train on Valley Fair Day, but I'm not sure. But it's about every uh, passenger car and passengers in the box car and the train in the south. Next slide. This is a later bridge. This was brought down from one of the northern parts of the Central Point Railroad and placed over the Salmon Hole Bridge. This is taken in the standard gauge days. This bridge was built in 1890, was placed in this location in 1897. If you can notice, that the abutment on the north side has been constructed and the long trestle equipment has been filled in. One of the things about Valley Fair Day, which so we saw a train heading south with a lot of passengers, during Valley Fair Day, when the fair was in Brattleboro, the trains, the Central Vermont West River would run extra trains to carry all the passengers that wanted to come from up in the middle down to Brattleboro to visit the fair, and then at the end of the day, they'd run all the trains back up, while depositing all the passengers between Brattleboro and South London area. If you look at some of the schedules during that day, there were like three or four extra trains running up the valley just to take care of this. Back. This is Sand Hole after the 27 flood. Unfortunately, the river scoured the north uh, abutment and it went into the river taking the bridge with it. And this is what essentially stopped the railroad from running after the 27th flood. I think since the 27th flood, Irene and the 38th hurricane, 
We've had 300 year floods. Next slide, please. This is the replacement bridge. This was another bridge brought in by the Central Vermont from Waterbury and erected over the West River. The greater part on the south part of the bridge was uh, a Boston main structure that the West River purchased. What happened after the 27 flood, essentially, in the early 1900s, in 19, 1910 especially, the Central Vermont Railroad was under control of the Grand Trunk Railroad. And Hayes of the Grand Trunk Railroad was interested more in constructing the Southern New England Railroad than he was in actually <coughs> investing in Grand Trunk properties. The Southern New England Railroad was goal was to run from Providence to Palmer, Massachusetts to link the open water port of Providence through the uh, Central Vermont properties, although Hayes died in 1912 when he was a uh, passenger on that unfortunate uh, ocean liner called the Titanic. And what happened from there, the Central Vermont, the Grand Trunk kind of slid along until 1917 when the railroads were nationalized under the USRA authority that on the onset of, uh, just shortly after the onset of World War I, and at that point, there was not a lot of money going into railroads that weren't really contributing to the war effort. Although the West River was shipping a lot of lumber and chair stock, there wasn't a lot else coming down on the valley that really contributed to the war effort, although the West River didn't come under the control through the of the central of the USRA through its control of the central Vermont. There wasn't a lot going on in the valley in the period from 1917 to 1920 that allowed the West Central Vermont to put a lot of money into the West River. What happened after that in 1921, the control reverted back to the Central Vermont and local interests. The Central Vermont again started putting money into the river, upgrading the tracks and bridges. But the 27th flood had essentially took care of it, and by the time the railroad came back, in 1931, we had gone through the Depression, and any traffic that was remaining in, on the West River had gone to trucks by that time. Next slide, please. This is looking south through the valley from the Long Island Mountain towns. This is about the only place where the railroad actually is in the brick line. There's this little section in here. Brookline didn't bond for the railroad, and consequently they didn't get a lot of railroad. <laughs> anyway, it comes out across the toe of the mountain. Um, Riverview Market? Riverbed. Riverbed, sorry. It's right in here. <coughs> Route 30, passing through here. And then we come in and we come into Willard's Mill. Next slide. Fortunately, we don't always get to Willard's Mill first. <laughs> this is a, a picture of a development at Willard's Mill, northbound train. Um, at the time, what they were doing was rolling the roads with a snow roller instead of plowing the roads. And what they had done was they had rolled the snow into the flangeways of the crossing. The flanger had not gone up. The engine should have had enough weight to power its way through, but unfortunately this time it didn't, and 51 ended up in Willard's log yard. Next slide. This is about a five yard, uh, five shot sequence of that. Next slide. This is the tank in Townsend. That's why this picture is in here. This is the other end of this grade, where a train before it would be going up to Newfane would want to go ahead and tank up water up before it attacked. Great thing to uh, you think. Next slide. Another slide, thank you. I love the lady with the hat. That's just. <laughs> it's an event. <laughs> Next slide, please. <coughs> Shortly after the, the, the derailment. Next slide, please. Next slide. Willard's Mill 
was a chair stock and lumber mill that existed just on the other side of Route 30. Burned several times, but it's now incorporated into what remains of the Townsend Furniture Factory. Oh. Looks like Boys Mill looking from the north, he's looking to the northwest. The main line runs here. The spur back into Willards comes off of the main line and backs in. Here. Next slide. Looking north from Willards Mill into Townsend Depot, section house. I just found out where that was recently. And this is the remnants of the woodshed from the standard gauge, uh, from the narrow gauge days. And Townsend Depot is just on the other side of this building. Next slide. This is Townsend looking to the south before the addition was put on the station. Again, in the early 1900s, Townsend was expanded to the south of the addition. So the station layout did change a little bit in the narrow gauge days with the northbound train approaching the station. Next slide. This is Townsend Station just shortly after it was constructed with the JL Martin heading northbound with the mail train. Normally, I, I don't try to make things facts. Normally, you can tell which direction the train is going by where the mail car is. Because the mail car normally always faces towards Brattleboro. Normally faces towards Brattleboro. But this time the mail car is facing, the mail end of the mail car is facing towards South Landonbury. So just when you think you've got it down. Next slide, please. This is the Brattleboro engine number two, again in 1880, uh, Danforth and Cook locomotive at the West Townsend, at the Townsend uh, Lumber Shed Townsend Depot just sits for the background. But this time the engine has air brakes and train brakes and steam heat for the passenger. There, there's an odd configuration here, and I believe this is a result of the wreck at Three Bridges, that the steam dome doesn't have a cover, but really has a cover very similar to this. But after the wreck at Three Bridges, the Brattleboro doesn't show a steam uh, outside covering on the steam dome for a while. And I think that's the, the reason why it's on there. Next slide, please. This is the J.L. Martin heading south towards Brattleboro. I do know this. It really is the mountain sign up. It is heading towards Brattleboro. Um, again, the mail section only faces towards Brattleboro. This is taken between 1892 and 1900. Next slide, please. This is an ice jam on March 4th, 1902. The really big significance is this is where the first one of the first times the, the narrow gauge snow plow shows up in any photographs. This is taken between Townsend and West Townsend or Scott Bridge. Next slide. This is, I, I don't, for a better term, I call this Leonard switch only because this is at the point where, um, excuse me, of the, the um, land that this switch was on was owned by a man by the name of Leonard. This is north of Scott Bridge, before you get to the Ball Mount, uh, uh, Townsend Dam area. What is interesting is after the 27th flood, <coughs> the Central Vermont allowed the Valley residents to go ahead and take over, the, lease the railroad and take it over. But the one thing they didn't give them was all of the boxcars in the 8,000 series, 83,000 series. This is one of the boxcars. They didn't care about the railroad. But they wanted their freight cars back. Next slide. This is um, the West River Valley. It is between, it's in the area of the setback of Townsend Dam, looking to the south. Next slide, please. This slide came to me by a friend at UVM. He was going through some photographs in the UVM collection. He goes, do you know where this is? And I looked at it and I go, yeah, I do. This is Rainy Book Trestle as you come out of the setback 
from Townsend Dam into the West Townsend Station, the West Townsend Church sitting up on the hill right there. This is as the railroad is being constructed, so 1879, 1880. Next slide. This is an ice jam just north of there, prior to the West uh, Townsend Station. This is the West River tended to come out of its banks a lot in this location between here and Wardsboro, and this is one of the areas where it did come out. There's hand shoveling this so they can clear it up to West Townsend to get the train through. Next slide. West Townsend, Taps Mill siding off to the right. Taps Mill again was a lumber and chair stock mill. It has survived the, uh, till the end of the railroad. Next slide, please. This is the West Townsend Station looking to the north. Next slide. This was again taken by a baggage master on the Brattleboro and Whitehall. Taken from the baggage <coughs> master. He had a little box camera that he took along with him and he shot photographs as he was going up the gauge. This is one of the photographs he took of the West, Armstrong, uh, West Townsend Station. Next slide, please. This is West Townsend, an overview, looking down into Pass Mill, West Townsend Station, yeah. Depot Bridge, which now sits up at the Rockingham, Rock Country Store in Rockingham, crossing over the uh, setback, the dam, Mill Dam, then it heads north on the valley into East Jamaica, Wardsboro Depot. There's the Wardsboro Covered Bridge in the background. Next slide. This is just a little uh, blow up of the slide, again showing the overview of West Townsend. Next slide. This is West Townsend from the north, looking down into, again, into Taft's Mill in the West Townsend here, West Townsend Depot area. This was all basically an island with Granny Brook coming down on this side, Henry Brook coming down on this side, and covered bridge going on in the island. Next slide. Taft's Mill. Next slide, please. Again, Taft's Mill. Narrow gauge lumber cars again on the right. One of the things to think about when we're thinking about the West River is think about all the trucks that you see on Route 30 today, all the Sarsasimals and lumber trucks that you see today. And remember back in the 1880s through the early 1900s, all that traffic was going down by rail. Next slide, please. This is a snow train coming into West Townsend. I believe this one is definitely heading southbound. Two engines on a flanger, followed by the southbound mail train. Next slide. Center Route 192, London area leaving West Townsend heading for Brattleboro. Next slide. From West Townsend, you head north across what's called Gleason's Park. Gleason Park. The Gleason's Garage would sit back up here on the hill. This is all land owned by the Gleason family. West Townsend Church again, sitting right there in the background. It's easy to identify those pictures of that church. Huh? Next slide, please. This is after the 27 flood looking south through Gleason Park. Again, this is the spot that probably the railroad got hurt the most after the flood. The railroad, the West River basically came out of its banks at French Bridge and didn't really go back into its banks until it got down to um, Santa Hall. Next slide. <clears throat> this is a photograph looking north into East of East Jamaica slash Wardsboro Depot. The interesting thing, Clinton Store sits in the center here, and this is Fitz and Lime, the Martin and Fitz Lime Company. This was, again, J.L. Martin, James, uh, I knew it. Martin was a, a lawyer in Brattleboro, born in Landgrove, who was one of the big supporters of the railroad, and he also was an entrepreneur, and he started Martin and Holden Lumber Company. And Martin and Fitz Lime. And this is the Martin and Fitz Lime and Cement Company in East Jamaica. Next slide. 
This is a pretty fair photograph looking into East Jamaica with Clinton's store again. We're out heading to the north. Next slide, please. This is looking to the south from Wardsboro Road into East Jamaica prior to the 27 flood. Next slide. <clears throat> East Jamaica Depot, again, a duplicate of Williamsville and such. This, this is the original depot. Shortly after the depot was constructed, they constructed this additional freight room, which it would later be leased to a, I believe it was a furniture man at the time. Next slide. <clears throat> this is uh, East Jamaica looking south. This is engine number four. After the J.L. Martin burned, remember, burned in 1901 in south of London area, the central Vermont slash West River found themselves short on power. So the Central Vermont Railroad got number four for the West River. They had number four and uh, provided it and outfitted it for the West River. The interesting history on this engine was built by the Baldwin Locomotive Company in 1873 for the Herkimer Newport and Poland Railway in New York, which would later became part of the Adirondack and St. Lawrence Railroad. And when it went over to the Adirondack and St. Lawrence, the engine was standard gauge. It was transferred to the Central Models number two in 1894. Uh, sorry, number 12, I'm sorry. But it's number 12. And when the, since it was had been a narrow gauge locomotive, the Central Vermont converted it back to narrow gauge in 1902 for the West River. And it ran up until the end of the Next slide, please. This is a slide out of Wardsboro Depot. And again, East Jamaica and Wardsboro are kind of interchangeable because it was East Jamaica, it was Wardsboro Depot located in East Jamaica. Next slide. East Jamaica slash Wardsboro looking at the south. By this time, prior to the 27 flood in the 1920s, E. Crosby of Rattleboro had erected a feed mill in Wardsboro, sitting just to the south of the depot. Next slide, please. This is East Jamaica looking south after the 27 flood where the river came out. Basically, all of the tracks right in here were all scoured and undermined. Next slide. Looking to the north. No tracks. French Bridge was the next obstacle of the railroad came under when it came north out of East Jamaica. French Bridge sits today as you cross, the Route 30 crosses over the West River and heads down into the flat by Coda and Coda. This was the bridge, French Bridge, and there was a bill that actually went under an underpass as it headed north into Jamaica. Next slide, please. This is French Bridge looking to the north with the fill. Today, if you're trying to find this fill, the you can find the original highway uh, bridge abutment for the replacement bridge just to the north where right here. But this fill has all been filled in all except the last maybe three or four feet. So it's all filled in now and this cut doesn't exist anymore. Next slide, please. This is French Bridge after the 27th. Well, this was French Bridge after the 27th. Floor. Next slide. This is looking north from the deck of the overpass, looking north into the valley into Jamaica. This is where all those um, trailers sit along the side of Route 30, opposite Coda, right before Coda and Coda. Next slide. This is a place called Twin Bridges, and Bruce Chapin identified this for me. This is from the uh, baggage master from the mail car. It's one of his one of his shots that he took as he's going up on the line. I believe this is. Shortly after the line was built, or as the line is being built, but it looks like they're laying rails and doing some timber renovation or timber erection along uh, the track. <coughs> this sits about a mile south of um, Jamaica State Park and the entrance into the state park. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, after in the late 1920s, the CV was operating the railroad with the 50 series 440s in American type. And the engines that they were operating on the railroad at the time were 
a little underpowered for the amount of freight that they were trying to carry over the hill between Townsend and Newfane. Two cars, three cars, that was it. So what the Central Vermont did is ordered a series of rail cars from the Brill Motor Car Company to outfit their branch lines with, and the one they got for this uh, West River was Brill 149. <coughs> Brill 149 was different from the other other three cars that they ordered and it. it was capable of hauling two loaded cars along with a load of passengers and it had a sh shortened passenger section and a special baggage section on the car. Plus it could handle two cars. Unfortunately, it wasn't as successful as it should have been. It was delivered in September of 27. This is one of the first runs, one of the first runs in the first two months heading north into Jamaica, and on the back end of this, unfortunately, is a tank car over the bank. Now, what was that tank car carrying? Well, in the early 1900s, after 1910, the Standard Oil Company established a fuel tank in Jamaica. And I believe what it was doing was hauling gasoline up to the uh, Standard Oil facility in Jamaica. Next slide, please. This is from the hill looking over the Baptist Church into what is now Jamaica State Park and the railroad as it approaches Jamaica. The covered bridge sits just on the left-hand side here. Oh, the reason I threw this in is I don't know whether this guy was trying to take a photograph of the scenery, but he happened to get a southbound train leaving Jamaica. Next slide, please. This is the curve approaching the Jamaica Covered Bridge into Jamaica Depot looking at the south. I love scenery shots, you have to bear with me. Next slide. The Depot Covered Bridge. Jamaica Lumber Company in the background. Next slide. Jamaica Depot with the mill yard up beyond. Next slide. And Jamaica Depot with the first water tank south of South London Dairy in Jamaica. Now, one of the interesting things in, J in Jamaica is there were four water stops along the railroad. There was Brattleboro, there was Newfane, there was Town, I'm sorry, five. Brattleboro, Newfane, Townsend, Jamaica, and South Londonderry. But at some point, the Jamaica spout disappears from the side of the water tank. In the 1920s, up until about that time, you can see the water tank has a spout. After the mid-1920s, early 1920s, that spout disappears, and I do not know the reason, however, Jamaica was still advertised as a water stop. The interesting thing about J the Jamaica tank is it's a duplicate of the tank here in Newfane. Same capacity, same uh, general construction. However, it's not there anymore. Next slide, please. <laughs> This is um, from the Fitz, uh, from the Cathan collection of a train just after the railroad's been constructed southbound out of uh, Jamaica heading towards Brattleboro. Again, Jamaica Depot, a depot uh, duplicate of South London Dairy with tank in the background. All mountain in the background too. Next slide. <clears throat> this is another slide that Bruce Chapin seems to find. I don't know where he gets it. This was a great um, cabinet photo he had of the railroad shortly after it arrives in Jamaica with a covered bridge, a combine, a, an arched roof bag, uh, a box car, flat car, and I could I blew the photograph up and I can't tell you whether it's the Rattler or the London Bay, but this is Jamaica Depot just shortly after it was constructed. <clears throat> One of the neat, unique things about Jamaica and South London Dairy as the need for space and storage in the depots increased, Jamaica solved their problem by building an enclosed walkway or a walk, uh, an, an enclosure between the two depots where South London Dairy actually built a, a baggage room between the two to combine the two structures together. Next slide, please. Yes. No, that is the highway bridge from Jamaica Village over into the depot. That bridge would survive until 1924 when it was blown down. 
This is an overview from Bald Mountain looking into Jamaica with the mill yard on the side. I don't believe, I can't find any indication there was actually a lumber yard per se at that, but I think this is where all of the lumber from Jamaica Lumber Company and the mills up the uh, valley were stored or stacked, dried, and then shipped out. But the interesting thing is on the hill here, this is the standard oil company tank where uh, flat tar uh, tank cars would come up and offload into the tank there. Next slide. <coughs> Excuse me, this is from the mill yard looking back into Jamaica Depot. Uh, narrow gauge car to push the lumber back and forth between the stacks. It actually shows that this was probably an active siding at one time during the narrow gauge days where the trains could actually get in here. The Jamaica tank in the background, the depot, and the covered bridge again. Next slide, please. Standard Oil Company. This was taken in 1913. This is the, uh, the tankers would offload through a pump, and the uh, gasoline would go up into the tank here, It'd be offloaded into tank trucks here, taken to the moving automobile uh, gas stations that were starting to pop up and down the valley. Next slide. <clears throat> Again, uh, Jamaica Depot, looking from the tank into the depot with a water tank here, the depot, and in the background you can see a, a station scale, which is kind of interesting. The only stations that I know that had platform scales of this order were Jamaica and South London there. Next slide. Leaving Jamaica, heading up the river, the first mill you came to was Wardwell's Lumber. Again, in the 1891 freight surveys looking at what was coming out of the railroad. Jamaica was the largest producer of lumber and chair stock on the railroad <coughs> with, I believe it was over 500 tons in one year. Next slide. This is Goodell's switch looking to the south at the Oxbow. Goodell had a mill on the hill which he would bring his lumber down, or it would haul it south. Next slide, please. Um, you've always seen kind of slides. This is a series of four slides. I'm only showing you one today, but there are four slides taken of this boulder on the track. Again, north from Jamaica, the railroad follows the toe of Bald Mountain, and there are a considerable amount of lot, uh, landslides between here and Pratt's Bridge. And this is the result of my train we stopped for a little while. Next slide, please. Windhall Station was the next station looking to the north. Lumber yard on the left. Boarding house just behind the station. Next slide, please. Windhall Station a little further in. Next slide. This is Windhall Station again. This is a slide. Um, by Caitlin of Train Time in uh, Windhall. Windhall was kind of unique in that Windhall wasn't considered a full-time stop all the time. A lot of times it was considered, a, uh, depending on the train, it was considered a flag stop. So in order to get the train, you would have to flag it down, switch back into the lumber yard. Next slide. This is an interesting photo because it's taken in 1903. This is the Brattleboro. It does show uh, cover on the steam dome now. It's not quite the same as the other ones, but one of the interesting things here is their flat car is, is lettered for an individual lumber company. It's a West River Brattleboro Whitehall flat car. It's one of the only ones I've ever seen that's lettered for one of the companies along the road. Southbound Mail. Next slide, please. This is Wind Hall looking from the north, crossing the Wind Hall Brook, the Wind Hall River, into the depot, and then south, Pratt's Bridge, on into. <coughs> Next slide, please. This is the boarding house of Wind Hall Station. This is where a lot of people would stay if the train got stuck coming south out of South London area. They actually advertise this, too. If you look, uh, what was the valley? 
Pepper Valley newspaper, the the sifter, the London Dairy sifter would advertise the boarding house rooms and the rates and such and such. And a lot of times, if the train wouldn't get south of Wynn Hall, this is where people would stay or wouldn't get to South London Dairy. This is where people would stay. Next slide, please. You got the other one. This is a wreck of the mail, southbound mail, February 1st, 1990. This is north of Wynn Hall Station. The train was heading southbound. Uh, South London area is this way, Brattleboro is this way. The train uh, just hit a bump and went off the track. This is the passenger car over the trip over the side of the bank. Mail car is off the track. <coughs> Interestingly enough, the Brattleboro and Whitehall had a postal contract until 1906. So there was a railway post office operating on the railroad between 1881 and 1906. I actually have. RPO stamps from all the different stations and all from the mail car. And in 1906, the only reason they lost the mail contract was because of the lack of a reliable service. From that point, they lost the mail car. They lost the RPO service. From that point on, mail was handled in sacks from Brattle Road to the individual stations as individual baggage. Next slide, please. Um, uh, my understanding is, is they're coming to put the train back on the track. U.S. mail. And the amount, every day there was about six to eight cars of pulp coming out of Melanie every day. And again, this is all hand-loaded too. Hand-loaded, unloaded, reloaded, and unloaded. Next slide. This is a group of fine fellows at Melody's Mill. This is an air gauge pulp car on the right hand side. Next car, next slide. From Melody's Mill, the railroad starts to slow and downgrade into South London Dairy Depot. If you look at this slide, you can just make out the depot in the end. Next slide, please. This is a Thayer photograph looking into South London Dairy Yard. South London Dairy Yard was kind of a shoehorn yard because there's not a lot of space between Melody Hill, the flat where the uh, turntable engine house was, the yard was, and then you had the West River. The interesting thing about South, this shot more than anything else, this is a Thayer photograph. This is one of the ones that my brother called me on. I go, I've got that. He goes, nah, take a look at it again. Porter Thayer, the calendar and the postcard that most people are normally see that says, uh, I think it's railroad south on the area, down here is actually taken from this side looking back in. This is actually taken a little further over to the left. Next slide, please. This is an overview of South London Dairy Yard with the turntable, the engine house, the water tank, and the, um, the wood house, wood bin, wood storage area for the wood-fired steam locomotives. This photograph dates after 1901 only because it's the newer engine house and the new water tank. The original one's being burned in 1901 in the fire that took out the JL Mountain. Looking up in the background of Billy Mountain. Next slide. This is looking in a little bit better into the yard with the new engine house and water tank. Wood, wood house, the narrow gauge mail car, the passenger train, passenger car sitting on the side. Next slide. This is looking into South London Dairy Yard a little bit before the 1901 fire. But as you know, this picture had to be between 1901 and 1900 and 1901 because they have the newer lettering, number two, on the engine. And this is the original engine house and the original passenger car shed in South London area, which burned in 1901. What's interesting is <clears throat> the West River was running short of narrow gauge flat cars at the time. And if you look at these cars, these box cars were constructed in the central shops in St. Albans on flat car frames. The reason you can see they have flat car stake pockets on the sides. Next slide, please. 
cell phones in there looking towards the depot. Part of the problem taking photographs of the depot is the team track sits right in front of it. So if you're trying to take a clear photograph of the depot, you can't because there's just about all the time there's a train track there, so you never get a really good shot. You can tell that this photograph is dated prior to 1910 only because the depot is not joined. What was it, 1910 was the date we figured about? Right around 1910, there was an addition built onto the station where the main station and the passenger station were joined together with a baggage room. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and there it is. It's somebody miraculously moved the train first. This is a lot closer to what it looks like today than um, it did in the early days. The only difference between the restoration now basically is that the, for ADA requirements, there's a flat platform there as before there was a raised platform to move right into the baggage called wax cars. Next slide. This is engine number four sitting in South London area, ready to go southbound. This is the metaphor, metamorphosis engine that we talked about earlier. Um, this is towards the end of operation of the narrow gauge, right before the area was standard gauge. Next slide, please. This is the um, mail train inside the mail car and the passenger train, passenger car sitting, making a part of the mail train in South London area waiting for its next run to the south with the depot in the background. Next slide. This is South London area looking to the south. The interesting thing is you can tell this photograph predates 1910. This is a Harry Chapman photograph and it's one that I hadn't seen before taken from a different vantage point than most of them normally are. This is the Central Vermont um, boarding house slash uh, rooming house sitting on the hill. <clears throat> the Central Vermont was part of the people who worked at the railroad didn't always necessarily go Rattleboro, Rattleboro to South Londonderry and back. A lot of times they would start in South Londonderry, go down to Brattleboro and continue on to Miller's Falls before they would turn around and come back. Same time, a lot of times the people from Brattleboro would come up and stay overnight. And what would happen is this is the house that they would stay. This was operated by the CV for the engine man, conductor, and brake and such. It burned probably, I think around 19, part of 1910, I think. I, I have the exact date at home, but I don't remember exactly. Next slide, please. This is engine 50 on the uh, turntable itself, legendary. This photograph dates prior to 1919. In 1919, the Central Vermont increased the size of the roundhouse by building an additional stall and moved the water tank over to the other side of the track. This is in standard gauge days. This is the typical 440 that was operating on the railroad. And after the railroad converted to standard gauge, the mail car was taken off of its trucks and used as a tool car in South London area. And here's the mail car sitting on blocks over the side by the engine house. It would actually survive the railroad up until 1950s, I think. Is that when your dad took the photo? You took the 1960s. 70s. 70s. Okay. The mail car was cut in half. The mail section sat as a separate house up by the red blinker in South London area. If anybody remembers that, it was on the north end side of the road. The mail section sat there as a residence until they got into a pissing contest, I believe it was, and the guy pushed it over the bank and burned it. <laughs> I'm sorry, though. I probably did. Next slide, please. This is South London area towards the end of the operation. This is taken in 1933. Engine number one sits on the back of the train here looking into the South London area yard. Again, the South London area yard was a very small yard. This is the main line right here coming in from Brattleboro. This is the team track sitting on the side. This is the passing track where you pass, where you would get around your passenger cars, get the engine to the other side of your freight cars. This is the engine house lead going back into a two-stall front house, the water tank. Now we go around to the left. And this is the uh, Crosby's milling spur. This was Crosby's third plant, the one in Brattleboro, the one in East Jamaica slash 
Wardsboro, and this other plant in South Londonderry, Feedbell in South Londonderry. Next slide, please. This, is, this slide kind of covers a lot. This is Ashley's motor car, which was former Hoosick Tunnel in Wilmington, number 50. It barely had enough power to make it on the Hoosick Tunnel in Wilmington between the Hoosick Tunnel and Wilmington, let alone make it over from um, Brattleboro to South Londonderry. It unceremoniously burned in the West Dunmer Granite Quarry, but here it shows in South Londonderry, not them out of gauge. And there was H.H. H. Payne never ran south of South Londonderry again. Interestingly enough, the whistle from the H.H. H. Payne survived for several years as the whistle at Smith's Mill, but then it disappeared. Next slide, please. This is the end of the line for the northern part of the railroad in South Lincolnary. The rails have been pulled, the cars have been tipped over for the scrap metal, and pretty soon they're going to be burned. There's only one problem that's in this picture. Flanger 4236 is still here. The Senate wanted this back badly. And since there were no rails to haul it back to the problem, we had to figure out another way to get it out of there. What they did, and I have the paperwork, they tried to get the state of Vermont to haul it over the road between Brattleboro and Chester. They finally found an independent contractor to build skids, and once he, in the winter, he hauled it from South Londonderry over to Chester, where it was put back on the rails delivered to the Central Vermont Railway. Interestingly enough, it survived the Central Vermont Railway, went to the Green Mountain Railway, and uh, I don't remember exactly how many years ago, but it was then sold to the private person in Putney who converted it into a little bit of an office room. Next slide. This is pretty much the end of the railroad. Um, a couple slides I've thrown in here. This is Boston and Maine Mail, uh, sorry, uh, Sykes Gas Electric 1120. This was purchased by Ashley at the end of, after his first mail car burned up in West Dunderston Quarry. He operated this between Brattleboro and the quarries on an as-needed basis when there was uh, freight to be delivered to the quarry or West Dunderston, or in the um, event that he needed to haul Granite, he would use a steam engine. This could pull a car, one car load of granite, though. At this time, this is taken in about 1936, when the rails have been taken up between South Londonderry to the north end, or the, to the south end of the Williamsville Bridge. Next slide, please. This slide was on eBay a couple of months ago, and I looked at it, and I knew almost exactly where this was and nobody was bidding on it. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. And this is taken at the milk plant in Brattleboro. This is Ashley's motor car sitting on the siding. This is the steam locomotive that Ashley purchased from the Montpelier Laws River. It was used for the scrapping of the railroad when his gas car wouldn't work. It's from the Montpelier and Walls River number 14, which was a 440 built by Alco Schenectady of the type used on the Boston and Maine Railroad. Next slide, please. In my final slide for tonight, I'm sorry I'm kind of all over the place tonight. The last car of a train is called the caboose, or it's at the end of a train. Now, I, I've always been told to be careful about what you say and never say never. Now, on the West River Railroad, all the trains were mixed trains or passenger trains or mail trains. So that normally involved a combine on the back of the train. And I had never seen a picture of a caboose on a West River train. So somebody asked me, do cabooses run on a West River train? And I said, I've never seen one, so I don't think they ever did. And sure shit. <laughs> OK, so since I'm there, as soon as I, sure enough, some smart sent me a picture going, see, I told you so. <laughs> so be careful 
what you say. <laughs> never claim you're an expert. Never claim that anything is certain. And never say never and always watch out because somebody will prove you wrong as soon as you make that statement. <clears throat> Sorry I'm losing my voice tonight. It's been an ongoing thing for a couple of weeks now. Thank you for coming. Please support the New Fame Depot. I hope it works. Sure.